Thank you so much, Ted and Tracy, for the beautiful music. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to Tridelphia and happy Sabbath. We are, we are very happy to be here, and I mean it. I was yesterday coming back from my flight from, from, from work in the Caribbean, and I was really praying. I didn't want to miss Tridelphia. And thankfully, no cancellations or delays. And last night I got to BWI, and today, happy to be here. So, very happy again. And first, I wanted to thank uh, our friend Doc Venn for preparing such a careful uh, table. For me, it's extremely useful. That says everything that I need to, to say. And thanks so much. <laughs> okay, we have uh, several announcements. Very, many things are going on in the church, and we are very happy for all the activities that we have. So the first announcement, if, if we can, is from the family department. Or we can do it second. Second? Okay. So let's do first, then our, our friend Tony, who has an, oh, another important announcement. He's here. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good to see everyone. Good to be up front. Appreciate your prayers. I actually have a second announcement. I have two that just occurred to me. This just came, I should say this, is that Maryland Men of Faith. Anyone here heard of Maryland Men of Faith? Yes, I see lots of hands. Maryland Men of Faith is, uh, is a uh, lay-led, conference-sponsored uh, ministry for men, one, year, one, one Sabbath a year, first Sabbath in October. So October 1st, we have a conference. That's not what I want to tell you about, but I just did anyway. Um, and we'll learn more about that's mmof.org. But what I did want to tell you about is that we've uh, started in our leadership to expand and to uh, include local uh, outreach ministry as part of Maryland Men of Faith. So we do, a, we do a, a global offering each year, a men's event. Lots of ladies buy tickets for their husbands and significant men in their lives to come to the Maryland Men of Faith. So that's why I'm talking to the ladies also. But on July 16, two weeks from today, at 3 p.m., the Maryland Men of Faith laymen are going to be getting out in the community. They're meeting in Silver Spring area to hand out literature and water bottles. Some people will be more interested in water bottles, some people more interested in literature. But we have an opportunity to get out and we're going to sing and pray with our community. It's at 3 o'clock, uh, two weeks from today. And if you have questions about that, you can see Alex Partika. He's part of the leadership of Maryland Men of Faith. You can see Justin Kim. You can see myself and also our local men's ministry leader, uh, Gonzalo Pita. So now why I really came up here that Gonzalo thought I was coming up here was is the parade. I actually, let me just see this. I have a personal request from your community. F requests are flooding in. Your community are asking that you personally give them a fan on July 4, Monday morning. They will be warm, even though it's 9 o'clock in the morning. They're going to be warm, and they're going to be looking for a fan. So they're looking for each one of you to hand them a fan. So I want to invite you, encourage you to come out and be with us. Um, we leave here at the church at 8 a.m. because we have to be in place by 8.30 a.m. for the parade to start at 9 a.m. It's locally here in Clarksville. So leave here at 8 to be there by 8.30. Now, you can go directly there. Um, it's a little more challenging, but you totally can. If you don't know where that address is, let me know. It's, it's been in some of our email correspondence. You can go there, but the trick is that they close roads at certain times and things, and so being on time, so let me just say this, Be, leaving here at eight is not the same thing as arriving here at eight, right? It's not the same thing. So you can arrive here at eight, and hopefully you can catch up. But so but I encourage you to be here, to leave by eight, to go out in our community, because they're looking for these fans. Um, it's a 2.2 mile walk. That is not long. Starts at nine, it's over, it's done a little bit after 10. We hand out fans, Tracy, and is Austin in here? Austin, Charles Marcel, he plays the violin. We play patriotic music. Tracy plays the piano on the back of our float, decorated nicely, 4th of July. So we have a special invitation for our young people, but that's been pre-recorded. So, oh, yeah, so I'll say, I'll say thank you for your consideration. I hope to see you uh, July 4. I know you already have that marked on your calendar. Just come to the parade. So please, please, uh, Gordon, thank you. 
Hey Tridelphi, it's Chandler and Tony again, and we're here to remind you about the 4th of July parade. Now, when we mentioned this before, we mentioned that we were needing vets because we had a special spot for them in the parade. But Tony, is there anybody else that we need help from? Well, absolutely, we want everyone to come from Tridelphia, but specifically we want to ask our young people, our mm. Tridelphia Sparks, our adventurers, the, the fireflies. fireflies. We need you to come out, wear, wear red, white, and blue. And we have some actually some special glasses we want you to wear. So kids, bring your parents, tell your parents to get in touch with either Tony or I or Pastor Sam, and make sure when they come out that they're wearing red, white, and blue. And we'll see you there. See you soon. Thanks so much. I'm always amazed by the attires of Chandler and Tony. Uh, very well. Okay, thanks so much. And now we, yeah, we do have the announcement from Family Ministry, the de department. Happy South Church. We would usually have a, a video but today we have some good news to share with, with the whole church. Uh, it's amazing news, actually. The team has expanded. So uh, that means that we're going to have even a stronger emphasis in terms of family ministries this coming year. So let's introduce him. So um, first of all, well, since we have him here, Rick Remmers and Shane Remmers are part of our team. And you can come up front so that people can see you and Doug and Don Van, and uh, Chantal Klingbeil, and uh, Magdiel and Susan Paris. She is downstairs in the kitchen, I believe. But um, you can come up front so that people can get to know you, and you can um, know that you can come to any of us if you have any suggestion, concern, or you want to just talk to anyone about your family. So uh, thank you so much for this team. I was pleasantly surprised when we had such a big team um, and it's gonna be a fantastic year, I believe. Thank you so much. And last thing, because we are interested in knowing what you um, want about uh, family ministries, uh, we are soon gonna be sending out a survey so that you can tell us which topics you're interested in, what activities were you're interested in, any idea, suggestion, or, um, or concern even. So uh, we want to hear you, and we want to make this a very strong year for our families. Thanks so much, Gabrielani. All right, many, a lot of activities, a lot of uh, production from our members. That's wonderful. We have another announcement from Peggy asked me to please announce that next week there will be a short meeting after lunch at 1.30 p.m.-ish uh, to discuss things related to BBS, to the Vacation Bible School. So those, all those who are uh, involved in helping in this ministry, please, Mark your calendars next week after lunch, a short meeting with Peggy. And the, f the four announcement is next week at 2.30 p.m., correct, Pastor? Yes. Okay, our good friend Gerhard will start a series of seminars that we will have for, sorry? Amen. Amen. From time to time, uh, and he will be presenting about uh, a topic related to the spirit of prophecy. And, uh, our good, here's Gerhard. So again, next week, 2.30. You know, everybody that has attended any of the seminars from Gerhard, you know that are fascinating. And so also please mark your calendars after Peggy's meeting to come to uh, Gerhard's seminar. Okay. Um, today we have potluck lunch and today, so please, it's under the leadership of Susan's team number one. <coughs> Sorry. So please stay with us and enjoy together uh, a good, uh, good moment of, of friendship. Okay, I think I covered all the, the announcements. I'm checking password, yes. Okay, so again, very happy to be here. Many things going on. 
And I will read the call to worship, which is now found in Psalms 29, 1 and 2. Psalms 29, 1 and 2. Beautiful, powerful psalm. It says, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Lord bless who those study the Bible. All right. So all that are able to please kneel. Uh, we will do so for, for prayer. Dear Lord, thank you again for the privilege of being in this church, for the privilege of opening the Bible and, and studying and learn from this wonderful book. And also thank you for, for the joy of our weekly meeting with our brothers and sisters. Thank you, Lord, for, for being with us during the week, for, for protecting us, and for bringing us here. We pray for, especially for those who have health requests, we put them in your hands. Uh, you know the, who they are, Lord. We know who they are. We pray intently for them. Our wishes, of course, is for healing. We, we intercede for them, and we pray that you bless the doctors, the nurses, everybody in, uh, surrounding, and the families for, um, of these brothers and sisters. We also pray for, for the church, for the world church, for the leadership, making important decisions for all the members around the world to bless us, to use us, to be more like you, to, to share the message of your soon return, and, and also to use us, Lord, to be useful members of society, to be a blessing to others who are around us, in our families, in our churches, in our neighborhoods. Also want to pray, especially for those who are involved in Bible studies, in this church and in all the other churches, and for those who are, for those who are wondering what's going on in the world today, that you bring, bring us to them to, to explain, Lord, the, the wonderful prophecies that we find in the Bible. We also pray for those facing difficulties in our church, in the churches around the world, Lord, in, in our neighborhoods as well. I also want to pray for the families of this church, Lord. Bless the kids, bless the adults, uh, bless our, our little churches that we have, and, and that the kids, uh, Lord, learn to be more and more like you. And, and as parents, too. I want to pray especially for, for uh, Elder Mike Sakupa, that you bless him, give him uh, the uh, wisdom and for everything that he studied, so that his word is your word for us, for this church, the, the, the message that we need today. And thank you again, Lord. We are so grateful for, for the privilege of being in this church today. In your name, amen. Good morning. It's good to see all of you. There was a mother attending church with her daughter and wanting to help teach her daughter some principles of generosity and selflessness, gave her a dollar and a quarter and asked her daughter to decide which one she would give in the offering that day and the other she could keep. And so the service took place, and as they were leaving, the mother asked her daughter, so what did you decide to do? She said, well, I knew I should give the dollar, but when the man called for the offering, he said that God loves a cheerful giver. 
And I knew I would be much happier if I gave the quarter and kept the dollar. Well, we may sometimes share in that dilemma as we consider what, what do we do in our, our faithfulness and returning tithes and, and giving of offerings. But a, a foundational principle is that it's, it's not really about money. Um, that, that's an external expression, but it begins with giving ourselves to God and recognizing the, the fact that everything that we have, life itself, is a gift from God and we are simply called to, to manage it um, according to his will. And so once we do that, then the question is, how do we do it for God's glory? And that brings us pleasure and joy and cheerfulness. And so as we receive the offerings today, they're for the local church budget, which means that it goes towards all the things, uh, electricity, keeping the lights on, repairs, and uh, materials for children's ministries and the Sabbath school departments, vacation Bible school that's coming up. All of those things receive funding out of the combined budget and help the, the church to function here well. And so I'd like to invite the deacons to come forward and we will have the offertory prayer before we receive the tithes and offerings. Let's bow our heads together. Dear Lord, thank you that you give us blessings day by day, uh, so numerous that we, we seldom take time to, to count them, to consider all of them. And Lord, as we return tithes and give of offerings today, Lord, I pray that we would have a cheerful heart, that we would find joy in giving, uh, joy in acknowledging your Lordship in our lives. And Lord, we pray that your blessing would be upon the the money that is given today that would accomplish your purpose and that it would advance your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. And we have our children's offering as well before we have the children's story. And if the children would help with this, this offering goes to help uh, support our young people receive uh, an Adventist education. And um, while they are collecting it, if you'd invite me in turning to hymn 218, When He Cometh, we'll sing that as the children collect the offering.
you, children. And if you want to come and sit up here, Mr. Wayne Harris has a great story for you. children's story this morning. Is everybody enjoying their time out of school? Everyone's out of school now? Yes, isn't it wonderful and hot outside? Well, if you remember, let's, let's work with some numbers for one second, even though you're out of school. Let's see how smart you are. What comes after number one? Oh, not bad, not bad. Okay, if you've done something one time, they call it once. What happens if you do it again? If what was that? Twice. Twice. Very good. Wow, that is smart. After one comes two, after once comes twice. So I have a story for you today we call twice. Do you remember I told a story a few weeks ago about a horse and a pony? Do you remember that story? How little Wayne wrote this crazy pony? Well, let's, about a year after that happened, little Wayne had a bigger horse. He got a bigger horse. And kind of the same thing happened again. There was this one particular day that little Wayne was going to ride his horse. But little Wayne wasn't a dummy. He was smart. So he thought about the mistakes he made the last time. And if you remember the story, one of the mistakes he made was he didn't put a saddle on the horse. Remember that? So he, was, he couldn't hold on well. And another mistake he made was uh, he tried to ride the horse while the horse was eating. And the horse didn't want to be bothered while he was eating. And the horse ran away. And, and another mistake he made was, remember he left the gate open. And the horse ran through the gate and knocked little Wayne off. Well, this time, little Wayne said he was going to be smart. He didn't try to ride the horse when he was eating. He put a saddle on the horse. And he made sure the gate was closed. A matter of fact, there was a barn. It was a different barn. But little Wayne took his horse out on the other side and walked his horse to the front. And he turned around and made sure he closed the gate so the horse couldn't run back through the gate. And little Wayne got this something called a stirrup. And he put his foot in and he swung his leg over. And he was going to ride this bigger horse because he's smarter now. Right, adults? We don't make the same mistakes twice, do we? Remember where you are. Be honest. So little Wayne's on the horse, and he goes, you know that? That's the giddy-up sound. It's too magical. You say, and you say, giddy-up. And you nudge the horse with your heels, and the horse starts walking. And the horse started walking. And little Wayne thinks, I'm higher up now. I'm a bigger horse. This is going pretty well. And he pulled the reins to the left, and the horse went to the left. And he pulled the reins to the right, and the horse is going to the right. He says, I think this is going pretty well. I think I can go a little faster. Of course he does. So he goes, giddy up. And he shakes the reins and he nudges the horse with his heels on the side and click, click. The horse starts going a little faster. Hey, this is kind of fun. And if you've ever ridden a horse as a rhythm, it's kind of bloom, bloom. You kind of bounce up like this. If a little faster is good, what's better? Faster, right? Giddy up. And he nudges the horse again. And this horse starts going pretty fast. And little Wayne's having a ball. And all of a sudden, what does he do? Uh, horse stops, turns around, and heads where? Back to the barn. But little Wayne's not concerned because little Wayne's smart. He thought about it. He closed the gate, and he held on to the saddle, and the horse is going kind of fast. And... That's when little Wayne saw it. See, you maybe haven't been to a farm and seen a lot of barns, but some barns have something called a split door. And it looks like this. It's a door, but it doesn't just swing open. It swings open at the top, and the bottom can stay closed. Or the top can stay closed, and the bottom can swing open like that. So, see, sometimes 
if you leave the top door open, especially horses and sometimes cows, they like to come and stick their head out the door just to see what's going on. But the bottom door keeps them from walking out. You get it? But sometimes you want to keep the top door closed and you open the bottom door to put their feet in or their water in so you can go, so you can choose which door you want to be open. And apparently somebody, probably daddy, opened the bottom door and left the top door closed. And the horse saw it. And he started for that bottom hole. Full speed ahead. He's running to the door. So what's going to happen? Because see, the horse is down here, but little Wayne is up here because he's on the horse's back. So what you do to stop a horse is you have to pull up real hard on the bridle and you put your feet down real hard in the stirrups and you say, whoa. I mean, you have to pull hard. If you pull hard enough, the horse's head starts coming up and they don't like running where they can't see. So when they can't see, they're supposed to stop. So little Wayne is pulling with all his might. Whoa, horse, whoa. And that horse is moving around. And that barn's getting closer and closer and closer. What do you think happened to smart Wayne who thinks and remembers what happened last time. Yep, you guessed it. That horse snatched his head down and ducked and went right in that bottom door. And little Wayne, <clears throat> sitting in the saddle, went right into the top door. Pow! Oh! He's off. He's laying on the ground again. Laying there like, ah. Oh. Horses maybe aren't for me. <laughs> and he sat and he rolls over and he's trying to see. And sure enough, his face hit the door and his body hit the door. And he has some scratches. So he has some bruising. Yet again, the horse stops, turns around and looks at him. Boys and girls, have you ever have you done anything not so smart twice? Have you ever gotten in trouble Two times for the same thing? Did you forget to do your chores once, then twice? Did you get to say yes, ma'am, once, then twice? Adults, have you ever done the same thing twice? Don't look around, little boy. Look, look, look at me, look at me. <laughs> what are they saying? Yes, we have a tendency to do things twice, but you know the good thing is? Jesus is still there to pick us up. The first time, the second time. What comes after second? Third. What comes after third? Fourth. What comes after fourth? Fifth. Do you know Jesus will pick you up one gazillion, million, trillion times? Oh, he does. The number, he always is there to pick us up and forgive us. Remember that. Jesus always does what? He forgives us. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for picking me up a million times. And if we counted all the times in this room, Lord, it would be innumerable how many times you picked us up. Thank you for that. And thank you, Lord, for being able to come so one day we won't have to fall down anymore. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. It's a pleasure to be here 
And I, Na and I are going to be playing uh, an arrangement of This Is My Father's World. Just like to, to ask you to just contemplate on, on the fact that God is our creator and that he, he owns this whole place and that we can trust in him each and every day. Thank you very much. Beautiful hymn, performed exceptionally. Thank you, Austin and Noah. Beautiful. Praise the Lord. Our Sabbath thought, it's, it's found in a letter, letter 30, that was written when Ellen White was 66 years old in 1893. And it says, Our faith increases by beholding Jesus, who is the center of all that is attractive and lovely. The more we contemplate the heavenly, the less we see desirable and attractive in the earthly. The more we continually fix the eye of faith on Christ, in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered, the more our faith grows, our hope strengthens, 
our love becomes more intense and fervent with the clearness of our spiritual insight and our spiritual intelligence increases. More and more, we realize the positive claim of God upon us to purify ourselves from the customs and practices of a world that knows not God, nor Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Tridelphia family. It's wonderful to be together and worship today. And thank you for that wonderful uh, rendition, Austin. This is my father's world, reflecting on God's creation. I got a call from my daughter this week, in fact, several calls. We were talking about different things, but the dominant thought and idea was about her car. And she knows who to call when there's a problem with the car. So as she told me, Daddy, there is a pool of water, or at least there's water coming out of the car. And so I was thinking, what could it be? So she sent me a picture and showed me exactly what was going on. So um, I saw that little river of water coming from the car, and I thought, trouble. And then I began troubleshooting with her. So the first question was, uh, when you start the car, how is the temperature gauge? And then uh, she said, what is the temperature gauge? <laughs> Then I knew I did not do my, a good job in orienting her about the car. And I thought, you know, it has been a while that she has, you know, been driving. She should know where the temperature gauge is. And so as we talked and I explained that it has a C and an H, and in the middle, that's where that little pin should be. Um, sometimes it will be below, sometimes it will be above, but in the middle, that's the sweet spot. That's where it should be. And so, as I thought about today's message with Jesus at the center of our lives, that is the sweet spot where he should be. The book of Hebrews has an interesting, unique structure. It is an epistle, a letter, but it has a sermon kind of form. So it was written to an audience that was facing challenges, that were threatening their faith and commitment to Christ. They were uh, pressed from many sides by persecution and even ridicule from society. They had received the gospel, they had embraced the message, and at first they were able to resist um, these uh, problems that were threatening their commitment. Are there situations that you face, I know I have faced them, where uh, your very core uh, commitment to Christ is challenged? Perhaps for many, it could be relating to separation from family, family tensions, loss of income, hospitalization, loss of a loved one. These and many others may be challenges that may make this call for a Christ-centered life relevant. There are lessons for us in the book of Hebrews that may help us as we reflect on our commitment to Christ as a center of our lives. We may also encourage others who are going through challenging times. And the call for Christ at the center becomes really relevant. But there are times of success, that even success may be a threat to one's spiritual commitment. The book of Hebrews has a very strong focus 
on Jesus. Jesus is presented as a ruler, as a high priest. He is the builder of the house of God. In Hebrews 3, verse 1 to 6, Jesus is an example of faithfulness. He is the apostle and high priest of our confession who was faithful to him. And in that text, chapter 3, verse 1 to 6, and particularly verse 2, we read that Jesus, as an apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to God who appointed him. Moses also indeed was, was faithful, but Moses was faithful only as a servant, and Moses was not faithful as the owner of the house. But Jesus is the owner of the house. His faithfulness indeed shows that he is faithful as an owner of the house. So as we look at the book of Hebrews, with all its themes, the themes that help us to understand Jesus coming at the center of this book, we also find um, in the following sections of the book of Hebrews that Christ has become, besides being at the center, he is also a high priest. And as we look at the book of Hebrews, especially looking at a number of sections in this book, we do find uh, the book of Hebrews really bringing this connection with Jesus uh, home. And I'd like us to look very briefly at some of the important sections that help us understand uh, this central idea of Jesus as being the, the center. We are his house. Verse 6 of chapter, uh, chapter, chapter 3. We are his house. Jesus is faithful over his own house. He is faithful to his promises to us. We are his house if we hold fast the confidence and also the rejoicing of the hope, firm to the end. This confidence and rejoicing is the result of faith. It refers, especially when we read 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, it refers to the great boldness in the faith which is in Jesus. As we look at this boldness, this confidence, how is it explained elsewhere? In the very same book of Hebrews, in chapter 10, verse 35, we read, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. And in chapter 10, verse 19 to 23, again we read, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful." What a wonderful assurance to know that Jesus has promised and in his promises, he remains faithful. Again, we find in chapter 4, verse 1 to 11, that there is a promise of rest. Jesus provides rest for his people. In verse 2 and 3 of Hebrews chapter 4, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard 
did not profit them, not mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed enter that rest. And we know the journey from Egypt to Canaan was not an easy journey. They were facing lots of challenges along the way. But as we look at the concept of rest uh, that they were looking forward to, resting from their toil in the wilderness, resting from their enemies, this was God's promise and, of course, conditional to their obedience and acceptance of that promise. Again, in chapter 7, as we go through the book of Hebrews, finding this center uh, in Christ, we find that Jesus is presented as the faithful high priest himself. In chapter 8, 7, verse 11 to 28, particularly verse 22, it says, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. So this surety of a better covenant relates to the work that Jesus has done as a high priest, the faithfulness that Jesus had as he presented himself, presented his, himself as an offering for um, his people. Now I'd like us to um, look at particularly chapter 11 as we have looked at various sections of the book of Hebrews where we see Jesus being central. The message of Hebrews really focuses on Jesus. Now I'd like us to look at the, uh, the message of chapter 11. Because this is where we find people we can relate to, mentioned, listed. Men and women who have toiled, who have endured, who have held up the faith. So as we look at chapter 11, I see some themes coming up. And we're going to be looking just at verse 1 to 7. Um, and then we will uh, summarize the rest as the author himself of Hebrews summarizes the, uh, the entire sermon as we may think of it as a sermon. And so looking at verse 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. This verse echoes creation. It takes us back to God's creation that was done out of nothing. God created this world um, with uh, nothing. His creative power is seen in both the animate and inanimate things that we see on the surface of the earth. And so we are worshiping a God of creation. And I would like to see some connections here as we look at Christ as the center of our lives. There is also a thematic connection with Revelation 14, verse, uh, verse 6 and 7, where we have uh, the first angel's message. And later on, we're going to be uh, looking at this, this connection. But looking at um, the very first two people that are mentioned in verse 4, Abel and Cain, um, we know their story. And you know, this week I, um, I asked Sonny, my son, um, to help me uh, understand the heroes too. So I had missed Heroes 1, so now I wanted him to help me understand Heroes 2, because I was going to be talking later in this month with uh, some uh, youth uh, that perhaps don't even know the faith, so I was preparing myself for this. So uh, Sonny said, well, I can help you review uh, Heroes 2 and help you understand how it works. 
uh, this is a Bible game uh, that the church communication department has prepared, you know, to uh, help our young people, even for adults. Uh, to, it's a Bible quiz game where you can understand especially the heroes of the Bible, the stories of the Bible. So looking at Hebrews chapter 11, we have a whole list of um, these uh, Bible heroes here. So as we look at uh, particularly Abel and Cain, we see this story with a focus on worship. It echoes creation. It, it, it echoes the time, uh, the very first worship experience that these uh, young people had. And so when we look at the story of Cain and Abel, the first children of the first couple on earth uh, presented um, within this worship context, they both presented offerings to God. Two different offerings. One offering is accepted and the other is rejected. And the reasons for the rejection of uh, one and the acceptance of the other is not very explicit in the text. So as we look at the reasons for this rejection, one um, scholar would say that it is perhaps the attitude of the giver. But we do find uh, biblical uh, messages or at least evidences that help us understand uh, this idea where God at some point also rejected uh, uh, worship that was uh, presented to him. In Micah chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, we read, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Very clearly here, uh, God is rejecting worship and he is demanding something else that should come before worship. He is demanding a connection. He is demanding love, mercy, and an attitude of working humbly with God. In Isaiah chapter uh, 1 verse 11, we find also a similar uh, case where God is addressing his people. Uh, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, of fat, of fat cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats, God rejects their festivals, their sacrifices, and even their prayers. These are an abomination without this right connection and attitude towards God. And he says in verse 17 of chapter 1, Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, and plead for the widow. So here, uh, God is setting things right uh, to Israel about worship. And he talks about what should come before worship. Uh, that there should be um, a cessation of evil within the camp of Israel. And that they, they should learn to do good and seek justice and uh, depend, defend the poor and the weak among them. So as we look at um, this uh, theme again, uh, look at these stories. I want us to look at Enoch in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. The Bible simply says about Enoch that he pleased God and Enoch glorified God. And as we look at this theme um, and looking at the uh, uh, messages in Re Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, glorifying God is one of the themes that we find there. 
And in verse 5 of chapter 11 of Hebrews, the Bible says, By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So Enoch also had confidence in God's promises, and his endurance ended in God taking him away from this world alive. Enoch did not see death. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 24, the Bible records that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. What an interesting experience to walk with God until God says, let's go home. It's uh, enough now. We've walked together for, for all this time. Let's, let's go home. Uh, Zanella and I like walking uh, around our neighborhood. And we see a lot of people also walking. And as we walk, we talk and connect talk about a lot of things, um, but there are times um, when she wants to walk and I don't want to walk. There are times when I want to walk and she doesn't want to walk, but we still walk together. So as we, um, as we look at the, the idea of walking with God in the Bible, you find that it has a significance with the connection a person has with God. Looking at Noah as an example, um, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and he walked with God. God was glorified uh, by those uh, who walked with him. So those who walk in the spirit, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 22, um, also live a life connected to God. And so um, the Bible talks about, from verse 22, all the fruits of the Spirit. I know the kids have a song that they sing about the fruits of the Spirit. And I wish I could give them that opportunity to sing that song. It talks about love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And it says, against such there is no law. So those who walk with God are in harmony with him, with his word, and also with his law. And the last uh, person we're going to be looking at in this short section uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 to 7, is Noah. Noah warned of divine judgment. Again, we have a theme of judgment coming up um, in this, and it connects again to the first angel's message. Uh, by faith, the Bible says, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. There are some indications of investigative judgment as we look at Noah's experience in Genesis chapter 6. When God saw the wickedness of man, he said in verse 3, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great, verse 5, in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Notice the emphasis there. It was not evil occasionally. It was evil continually. God had investigated and saw the condition of the people in Noah's time. And God made a decision that he was going to destroy the world with a flood. And this came as a result of God keeping on uh, trying to reach uh, human beings. In fact, even after this, God still required Noah to preach. And Noah had to preach for 120 years. 
I don't know if any of us could reach that record of preaching for 120 years. And I know some have preached maybe 120 sermons already. I don't know, but uh, uh, preaching for 120 years and not a soul uh, comes in uh, is a really remarkable showing Noah's um, intent and also God's plan to reach uh, as many as possible. And so as we look at the book of Hebrews, uh, especially chapter 11, uh, it made me think of a song, a recent song by the Gaither Vocal Band. Uh, and the song says, and the song goes on and on and on. And so as I thought about this sermon, it looks like the sermon is going on and on and on. Because uh, when one looks at the writer in verse 13 of chapter 11, he says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them far off. And in verse 32 of this chapter, he says, what more can I say? And he says, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, and the list goes on and on and on. And of course, when we look at chapter 12, verse 1, we seem to be also included in this because it says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Wonderful to know that we are also a part of this great cloud of witnesses, the list in chapter 11, um, many uh, that have gone before us who endured, uh, who were faithful uh, to the end. Yes, they faced challenges. They faced problems, but they were able to stay on until the end. So as we look at another sermon in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7, we're not going to preach this one. Uh, but I want us to look at the, the interesting themes that come out of uh, this and connect us to what we've just looked at in Hebrews uh, chapter 11. Revelation chapter 14 is the three, uh, uh, from, from verse 6, the three angels' messages. But I want us to just look at verse 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So here we see these themes that we've uh, picked up in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, coming out again in this sermon that is meant to be preached by us uh, today as we come to the end um, of time. It is the everlasting gospel, and we have to preach it. And the message is fear God and give glory to him. And we are uh, warning the world of the judgment that's coming, and we are informing them about the creator, the God of creation, who we all need to worship. So as I look at this message and think about the task that we have, particularly looking at the message of Hebrews 11, we may say, well, I have a good connection with God. I have a good relationship with him. Um, and that is important. The call is really for a Christ-centered life. 
And it is a call also to preach the message. So I want us to see the balance here as we look at these two passages that share a theme or themes together. Um, there's one phrase that I've been looking for an author for uh, that I've heard in many sermons before. <clears throat> preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. I didn't have enough time to really research and find uh, the author of this phrase, as I've heard it many times. And I wanted to bring it as an illustration, especially at the end, to see this balance. But I ran across a, uh, a blog that really challenged me as I looked at how this person was reflecting on this phrase and also dismissing um, the author that I thought um, was the author to this uh, phrase. Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. So Ben Smart says, there is a danger here that we can be encouraged to justify the fact that we don't preach the gospel with words, but the fact that we live a Christ-centered life. While it is true that our life in Christ may be a sermon, and Paul says it, that uh, you are leaving epistles. Gospel preaching needs to be backed up by a gospel-centered life. But the gospel preaching still needs to happen. If we're simply living a Christ-centered life, but not proclaiming the good news of Jesus, how are we any different from a morally upright Buddhist? How will our witness be any different from a philanthropic uh, atheist, live in such a way as not to disqualify your sharing of the gospel, but don't forget to share it. What a wonderful balance between having a Christ-centered life and also uh, remembering that we have a very special message to preach. The White Estate has prepared a special a book by Ellen White on the three angels' messages. And this book uh, follows the biblical uh, text uh, drawing from Ellen White's writings, a compilation from her writings. And it has uh, really helped me to understand her insights into the three angels' messages. And as we look at um, this challenge, this call, for a Christ-centered life, we also have a very special message to preach. And may God bless us as we think about ways in which we can present this special message for this time so that we may start the right way and live it out in our lives first and have Christ at the center of our lives and have the gospel impact our lives. And then we may be able to preach this message, especially for this time. And so may God bless us as we reflect on this important task and also reflect on each one of our important lives um, and the task we have. At this time, I would like us to end our um, service by singing hymn number 522. Him 522.
Father, we thank you for your word that has reminded us that as we come near the end of our journey here on this earth, we may face some challenges. We may face some stresses, and I pray that you may bless us as we reflect on your word and holding on in faith to our connection with you. Thank you for being available to receive us at all times. And I pray that you may seal our commitment with you so that as we uh, face various uh, problems, we may be able to have our anchor in you. And Lord, we pray that you may bless us also with the task that we have to share this message, to preach the three angels' messages. I pray that we may first connect with these messages ourselves and leave them out in our daily living and be able to share with those that need so much this gospel for this time. And bless us as we reflect on this entire day with you that we may continue to be in harmony with you throughout the days of our living. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.